Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Transforming 5G and the Big 5G event. Hi, my name is Tom Anschutz. I work for AT&T, and it's my pleasure today to introduce a wonderful lineup of speakers. I think it's, well, it's a really exciting thing for me in a bunch of ways. One is that um, this is kind of the, the pre-5G or pre Big 5G event workshop on open. So I think you, you should be getting used to the letter O. It's going to be all over the place. Um, but um, we have not just openness, but we have three times open cubed today. We've got the Linux Foundation Open Compute Project and the Open Networking Foundation all combining input to this track. So you'll get software, you'll get hardware, you'll get community. It's going to be really fun. All right, so. Um, one of the things that they asked me to do is to read the following, so I'm going to um, show you my lack of reading skills. Um, it's the health and safety thing you're obliged to say at the beginning of every day. So I'd like to draw your attention to the fire and emergency arrangements for this venue. Um, there are no planned tests. There's no fakes going on today. If the fire alarm goes off, it's the real deal. And um, it, they will advise you, you'll be told if there's a change and they decide to do a test instead of not have the real thing. Um, it's a siren sound. If you hear the signal to evacuate, you should immediately leave by the exits. The exits are in the rear of the room. And then your assembly point is on 4th, 14th Street and Welton, as well as Stout Street and Spear. And when you reach there, you just uh, you wait for instructions. Uh, don't, they, they say, don't stop to collect your personal belongings. If you discover a fire, don't throw yourself upon it, turn and run, and uh, press the nearest pull station, leave the floor, in, you know, the nearest way, and walk, don't run. Um, and if you hear the announcement to evacuate for any other reason, leave the same way by the nearest available fire exit, they're clearly marked, and don't stop to collect your stuff, and when you reach the street level, go to the assembly point. All right, any question? Oh, I shouldn't ask that, because I wouldn't know how to answer them. <laughs> um, while we're on the topic, there's a lunch today, and it's in the next room, 505, right next to this one. And also, um, there's uh, restrooms at the end of the hall in that direction and to the right. There, I think I did it. Good? Thank you. All right, so um, if uh, I guess everybody has an agenda already on their lap. And you can see it's kind of fun. We've got lots of things going on, um, including lunch and a networking event this evening, a lot of really interesting speakers. Um, and, and before we get started, though, with the first talk, why don't we um, have all of the folks who are either a member of um, ONF or OCP or uh, the Linux Foundation, could you stand up? That's you too, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. So I wanted people to see uh, who was here from the different organizations. And I don't know, you probably didn't turn around and look backward, but in the back of the room, there's two guys. Yeah, yeah, I'm pointing at you. <laughs> there's um, Bill Carter, who, who was waving. There he is again waving. And Dirk Van Slyke, they're both here from OCP. If you have any questions, um, they, they don't have a speaking spot, so I agreed to give them a shout out in the beginning. And they'd love to talk to you about many interesting things. Okay, so why don't we kick things off. Our first speaker is, oh, now I've got, give me a second. Our first speaker is Mike Moore from Nokia. And he is a specialist in wireless telecommunications infrastructure and product management and sales, architecture, design, development, integration, test, deployment, and support. His focus is on data center hardware and software and the telecom cloud. He's, um, you know, adverse in 4 and 5G and open compute. He's um, leading the uh, open compute subgroup of the telecom project at OCP. And he's also interested in rack mount and IP networking architecture. If I could have uh, you come to the front, Mike. I'll clear this stuff away. And I'm sure they'd rather hear what you have to say than what I. So there's a uh, clicker, okay. and you can laser people with the. With the oh, wonderful. Let's see. Does it work? It work? Oh, here we go. 
Health and Safety, Regional Crime Manager. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk about our uh, open compute, uh, open edge enclosure. This was a recent submission that we made to the Open Compute Project back at the OCP Summit in, uh, in was it March? March. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the background for it, our motivations for, for creating it, why we wanted to open it up to the community, um, and uh, some, of the, uh, you know, some of the efforts and, and activities that are going on around Open Edge. And so what we really, uh, what we're really focusing on, this is a, a slide that you see all over Nokia nowadays. It basically talks about the motivation for virtually everything we're doing, uh, not only in the hardware space, which we have highlighted here, but in the, in the software space, you know, as far as, uh, you know, as we move to 5G and as latency and throughput become critical for the success of 5G, we have the, uh, you know, we, we basically need to, to focus our our cloud stacks, our software, and our hardware to, uh, you know, to appropriately uh, be deployed and, you know, certainly in a cost-effective manner. And so when we talk about the central and the regional data centers, you know, these are, uh, you know, these are prime space for, you know, rack mount servers. Uh, we've actually adopted the open rack version 2 design, and we also, uh, you know, we, we highly deploy that amongst uh, telco operators. But then once you start to get down to the aggregate uh, edge and the far edge, and when I say far edge, I'm actually talking about, you know, out to and including the cell site locations, uh, the, the requirements for deploying out there become quite different, right? Your, your environmental specs are, you know, are different than they are in the, in the central data center. Uh, power may not be as readily available, may not be as scalable. Cooling may not be as readily available. And so when we started to, Think about deploying something to the to the far edge, where uh, you know traditional telco vendors have been doing baseband units and uh, you know and, and products like that for the last I don't know, what 40 years. They needed we needed to sort of rethink the way that we were packaging uh, you know our compute resources. And so out there at the open edge, this is really the opportunity to, to enable a lot of different applications uh, in the 5G space, in the IoT, in the MEC space, uh, you know, a virtualized uh, RAN, basically distributed to the edge, uh, public and private cloud opportunities, you know, because there are certainly going to be other, uh, you know, other vendors, other, uh, you know, software producers that are going to want to be able to deploy to the edge as well, right? So it's not going to be just a telco-centric or, you know, a, a single, you know, vendor-centric environment. And then also for fixed access and, and uh, you know, network transformation. You know, they're also now going, they may be lagging the, uh, you know, the, the traditional telco operators a little bit, but now the fixed guys are also starting to want to move to, you know, more of a virtualized environment. And so this is the, uh, the chassis. That we've come up with. It is a, uh, a 3U design. The uh, reason for the 3U design was really to fit into traditional uh, uh, cell site enclosures. Uh, baseband units very much come in this design. And in placing it around this design, it also enables a lot of enclosures that, uh, you know, that, that far edge operators are already using, you know, both indoor and outdoor enclosures. Uh, will enable this to really seamlessly integrate and, uh, you know, be deployed, to, you know, to the far edge without having to go back and, and you know, recertify a whole new generation of enclosures. Uh, 430 millimeters deep, that's the key to it. It's really intended to go into a 600 millimeter rack. It's uh, relatively light, you know, only 26 pounds uh, unloaded. You know, that's basically the, the chassis, the power supplies, and, and the, uh, the rack management controller. Uh, fully loaded, it's uh, a, a little, little heavier. I think it'll run about 60 to 65 pounds. Uh, we do support 1U and 2U half-width sleds. And 
we have redundant power supplies. You know, it's certainly important that even though we are deploying toward the edge, price is a, is a key driver. You know, the last thing we want to do is compromise on availability for this as well because the, the cost involved in sending a technician out to a cell site to, uh, to do a repair is, you know, many times more expensive than just, you know, strolling down an aisle in a data center and replacing a server. The sled capacity is 400 and 700 watts. The reason that we went 700 watts on the 2U, and I'll show you this in a little more detail, is we want to be able to ex support acceleration at the edge. So, you know, FPGAs, GPUs, DSP cards, you know, uh, that type of focused acceleration that's going to be a key enabler for a lot of, uh, well, for a lot of, of radio-based and uh, IoT-based acceleration, MEC acceleration is going to be, uh, you know, really drove us to create something that can, uh, you know, that can, can be a very focused and concentrated compute device. Uh, we are environmentals. We're going for full uh, NEB seismic zone four tolerance, and I just threw out an, uh, one in particular is the operating temperature, where we're, this is qualified up to 45C with short-term durations to 55C. Okay. The fans itself for the submission, this is part of the, part of the sled itself. And the reason why we did that was because we have, you know, this is a, an OCP accepted chassis design. And we actively want the, you know, the community to, to standardize around this and produce additional sleds, uh, you know, for additional functionality. What we didn't want to do was have a, you know, a, a fan assembly in the back of the, of the chassis that would basically force you to comply with our uh, airflow characteristics. Right, so we want you to be able to, to design your own fans, you know, whatever you need to dissipate the heat to remain within the thermal specs. Uh, that's the reason why it's, it's integrated into the, into the shelf or into the sled itself. The other thing is, um, you know, with the, like the, with the tradition of, of open rack, and, and we learned a lot in adopting open rack on how to uh, optimize TCO and reduce, uh, you know, maintenance times. This also has no uh, rear maintenance whatsoever. So in the back, all you see is the, the perforated sheet metal for the, for the air exhaust, and that's the, the only thing that you have in the back of that chassis. Advantage to that, especially out at the far edge, you can locate this up you know, very close to a wall and uh, you know, really optimize your space at the far edge. Um, I don't think, oh, I do have it here. Yeah, and we also support front to rear and rear to front cooling. You know, both, you know, both you'll find, uh, you know, as you deploy, you know, the farther out to the edge you deploy. The RMC itself is a very, uh, it's a very simple device. I wish I had, had blown up on this. But as you can see, the, the RMC in the lower left-hand corner of the, of the diagram, it has a simple microcontroller on it that's responsible for monitoring the power supplies and then an unmanaged layer two switch that provides a, you know, backplane connectivity via one gig ethernet to the BMCs of all the sleds in the, in the chassis itself. Uh, it, there is no uh, bearer plane, you know, no bearer traffic ever goes through this backplane. It is simply power, gigabit ethernet, and, and some limited control signaling. And the reason that we went that route is we didn't want to fall in the, into the same trap that we fell into with ATCA. Uh, you know, back when I was working ATCA, when we came out with the one gig spec, we were told that don't worry, it'll be compatible with the 10 gig. Well, when the 10 gig came along, it wasn't. So we needed to purchase a 10 gig chassis. We were told at that time that don't worry, it'll be compatible with the 40 gig spec. Well, it turns out when the 40 gig spec came along, it wasn't compatible either. So we want to try to, you know, once customers install this, we want it to last as long as possible and to be able to go through several generations of, of sled upgrades before you even have to consider replacing the, the chassis itself. So the, the two sleds that Nokia has, has offered to the community, and this is in an OCP inspired status, and we're currently uh, working through the, the approval process right now, are basically two uh, 1U 
servers. Uh, we, we do like the one U servers in that, uh, you know, in deploying in a virtual environment, being able to do away with those NUMA zones makes, uh, you know, makes deployment and, and operations a whole lot more straightforward. But then, you know, these are basically simple devices that, uh, you know, they're based on Cascade Lake uh, processors. They have uh, six DDR4 memory slots and also support for uh, Optane or Apache Pass, as some of you may know it. Uh, expansion slots with uh, full height half length and full height full length cards in the 2U and an OCP MES. The other thing is that we, we really only have uh, SSDs. You know, this has been our, our transition away from spinning media. It is going to be all flash-based devices, and the reason for that is we, it's all about availability. You know, we want to increase availability, increase the, uh, you know, the environmental tolerance on the devices, and so we got completely away from any spinning disks whatsoever. And so this really kind of builds, you know, as the foundation and builds the ecosystem, right? We have a, a compact design in the chassis itself that can be deployed in existing enclosures. You know, I, there, I mean, I'm sure there'll be new, you know, more optimal enclosures that we'll be coming out with for, for this device. What you actually see there uh, can even be pole mounted as far as the, the outdoor enclosures go. Uh, the open, you know, the open edge sleds, which are available, you know, compute, switching, storage, optical, you know, whatever, uh, you know, we've, we've introduced the, the, uh, the compute side of things. We certainly need, uh, you know, more options on the compute space. And then as we start to integrate more networking functionality, storage is, is certainly, a, I think, a, a lagging uh, adopter, but as uh, you know, as CDNs at the far edge begin to step, you know, pick up, then we're certainly going to have some need for uh, storage-based devices as well. And then acceleration, you know, FPGAs, GPUs, DSPs. So where we set on the Open Edge subproject right now, the uh, the chassis itself or the solution itself was announced back last April. And uh, you know, as we've gone through planning our, our contribution in the third quarter and fourth quarter, we had working versions at the Amsterdam Summit last year. We submitted the draft specification at the end of the year, actually achieved commercial av availability at the end of last year, and uh, had, a, in, in my opinion, a really successful face-to-face -face workshop out in, out in Mountain View uh, back in January, finalized the spec, and had it approved at the at the OCP summit. So now at this point, you know, we're going to continue to promote the uh, you know the chassis. We're going to look at at new ways of of uh, you know optimization of the chassis. We do have uh, meetings twice a month with the OCP ecosystem, and you know to, to develop the OCP ecosystem. And basically, this committee itself. It's surrounded, you know, but not exclusively to, you know, the dimensioning, power budget, cooling requirements, and networking requirements of this platform. Our uh, draft specific, actually, our accepted and draft specifications can all be found out on the uh, on the Open Edge link, which I have referenced below. And uh, and then as far as the, oops, sorry about that. And, and basically, what we're looking for that didn't seem to transfer very well. Uh, Additional sled designs. You know, we we have a uh, you know we're, we're certainly looking for additional chassis uh, uh, manufacturers, but we're really looking for different sled designs to meet the uh, you know the, the myriad of different uh, you know use cases and deployment opportunities that are out there. And so thank you. Great. Is there any questions? Oh, yes, please. You mentioned in your background you had some signaling. Could you just drop into that? Please? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And yeah. before you answer, uh, uh, the second question would be, uh, you did have a sled design. Uh, does that get brought to OCP or to you guys? Oh, it, it gets brought to OCP, not, not to Nokia. Yeah, we've... Uh, we, we've, I mean, we, we've turned this design over to the community. It, it's, it's the community's, it's the OCP's design now. 
and yeah, so I do get to use the laser pointer. So um, yeah, as far as the backplane goes, you can see you know this is basically the power distribution that goes from the power supplies to certainly run the RMC and the individual sleds. The uh, the the backplane power is all 12 volt DC. The uh, the power supplies themselves can accept uh, you know 110, 220 AC and negative 48 volt DC. The uh, Ethernet itself, you'll see, it comes off the switch and goes to each one of the sleds. And then the additional control signaling I talked about, we have uh, basically a, a physical address that the sleds can use uh, you know, when they go to uh, identify an alarm or uh, you know, an, an issue, a, uh, you know, or you know, when the, the RMC uh, would, would uh, detect some sort of sled extraction event, you know, it can do that also through uh, through con some control signaling. And the other major signaling we have in here is the SM bus or system management bus. While we draw that out to the power supplies themselves, we also wanted to have a connection from the RMC to the SM bus, I mean through the SM bus to the individual sleds in the event that a sled design came out that might not have had a BMC in it. And you wanted to do some sort of uh, you know, limited monitoring or, or configuration that could all be done through the RMC at that point. I got a question here. Uh, <clears throat> right here. Oh, yes. Uh, so you mentioned about control traffic flowing through uh, this platform. We don't ex anticipate any better traffic going through it. Uh, what sort of control traffic are we talking about? Is it uh, device communication with the radio, or is it radio communication with the core? Uh, you mean as far as what kind of applications would be uh, right? Would exactly. Be deployed on this. Mm -hmm. uh, well. You know, typically, maybe to go, hold on, maybe to go back to, you know, this diagram, it, it really, where you locate your, your control and your, your bearer traffic or user traffic really depends on your, your latency and your throughput requirements. You know, there's a, there's a lot of control signaling, you know, especially related to the mobile, maybe something that would go on an MME, you know, mobility management that is uh, fairly latency insensitive. Right, I mean, your, your best, most economic uh, deployment of that would be, you know, somewhere toward the, the regional or the, or the centralized data center, right? Where you're talking about, uh, you know, a, an IoT application or a, or a MEC application that has very low latency requirements or very high throughput requirements, you know, then you would want to target it kind of down in, in this area. So does that mean that we could technically run a SMF, UPF kind of an application on this device? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's I think, uh, um, one of the things I mentioned here. If you can see the, the virtualized distributed edge, you know, it, it's certainly a, a platform for a BNG virtual EPC, you know, 5G, CN, or, or VAS. Mike, I think, um, I think the gentleman might have been referring back to something you said earlier in your talk, mm -hmm. that there's no bearer going through the back. Oh, yeah. So the... So the backplane itself has no bearer traffic on it, right? So, so everything, the, you have no uh, bearer signaling on the backplane itself. Everything is front cabled, right? So, so just like open rack, uh, everything is front oriented, right? So, so all, the, uh, you know, all the network cabling, power cabling, all the maintenance is all front oriented. Right, so any sort of, of bearer traffic, whether it's control related or you know or you know bearer traffic, would all exit via you know PCI cards. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Hey, here's a microphone for you. Uh, uh, in terms of backplane, you mentioned there is no. Uh, traffic going through backplane. So in, uh, suppose you want to add some uh, acceleration card on some slide you're going to put in. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to do the inter-slide uh, communication later? OK, yeah, good, good question. So yeah, here's, a, here's an example of an accelerator that we've got, right? This uh, you know, big NVIDIA uh, V100 GPU. Right, so your your ingress and egress traffic would be, you know, in this particular use case over Ethernet, 
right? That would obviously connect to some sort of, of leaf switch uh, architecture and your traffic would travel between you know, this card and other cards you know, via ethernet. Right now we're specifying all uh, 25 gig ethernet for, for those ports, although we do support 10 gig and there's also uh, you know, 100 gig options that are available. No, 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 no. It, you, there is, uh, s since there, there, there is no communication between the, the sleds on the back plane, I suppose the BMCs could talk to each other if they wanted to, but there's, there's the, proce the, the, the Intel or the AMD or the ARM processors, they, they cannot communicate via the back plane. Yeah, within the sled. Yeah, so everything would, you know, enter... Uh, Inter-sled communications would all be through front-oriented uh, network cards. So, so Mike, you referred to the, uh, you made reference to RMC. Just to clarify, RMC is the rack management controller. Think of it as a uh, server BMC, uh, but in this case, at the rack level, it aggregates the out-of-band control functions for um, all of the sleds in the enclosure as well as the power supplies uh, in the enclosure and if there's any other uh, enclosure level features that allows you to do out-of-band management much like the BMC does. That's why the, the traffic on the back plane is really limited to BMC-like traffic. It allows you to gather telemetry information about temperatures, uh, fan speed, uh, it allows you to do um, you know, hardware, software reset of the nodes, uh, initialization, firmware updates, uh, those types of things. Um, right. The the RMC itself is is uh, is embedded in in a separate module in here, in the lower um, lower left, um, and so you see the schematic there on the on the on the, the slide. Um, we actually have a an open RMC project group, uh, and that group is is marching towards creating a, a, a totally open source base uh, open source project for firmware, and they have actually. Uh, uh, targeted this platform as the lead vehicle uh, to implement that that RMC uh, firmware. So think of it as as a you know BMC firmware, but in, it it does a an aggregation function. It also provides a standard API northbound as well as standard API southbound. That's based on Redfish uh, and Redfish uh, releases. Uh, again, very consistent with with Nokia's approach here. Um, and so that's that that work. Uh, not only this, the work that's being done by uh, Mike and Nokia through our our uh, the OCP Telco project, but he's also working with the uh, Open RMC project to to create a completely open source uh, firmware base. Back to the question about the FPGA. Um, so in the in the future, we see an opportunity for a lot of special function cards to be designed and integrated into that. And by having this control function in the RMC. At the rack manager, it allows us to then do some initialization and setup and firmware updates and so on, uh, you know, from the RMC down into these sleds without necessarily needing a full BMC implementation at the sled. Think about, uh, you know, doing a, a storage extension box or, or uh, some type of network function. Uh, you could use the RMC function to set that up, do the initialization. Right, right. And, and then one other comment on the, <coughs> the RMC itself. Uh, you know, Bill mentioned the, you know, the one gigabit backplane, and, and that's the only uh, network signaling that we have. We, we see it as being a long time before, you know, BMCs outstrip the, uh, you know, the bandwidth offered by, by one gigabit Ethernet. We also have uh, multiple, we have two 10 gig Ethernets and an RJ45 the, that are uplinks. The, the RJ45 is obviously for the technician or the craft that goes out and needs to plug in and monitor. The, uh, the 10 gig themselves are SFP pluses. The idea of that is we could actually daisy chain multiple chassis together. Uh, you know, the port count as you get out to the far edge is, is also going to be very critical. And if you can get away with, uh, you know, maybe a slightly smaller uh, switch, you know, that's just going to save you money in your deployments. And so being able to take what would be, uh, you know, 
up to six ports worth of, of Ethernet and compressing that down into a single port mm -hmm. and then taking say up to you know up to ten chassis and also likewise compressing that down into a single port is uh, you know very you know very cost savings at the edge. Now I know you're saying, oh wait a second, now you've got a, a single point of failure. That is true. However, the RMC and communication with the BMC is not required for the steady state operation of any of these servers. So you can go extract the BMC, plug it in, reset it, do anything you want with it. The servers all stay up and continue to function. So Mike, you're saying if, if you have several of these, you might not need a management LAN switch. A separate management switch. No. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I don't know if the, the question on PCIe was uh, being brought up, but if I could just tag on to that a little bit. Um, with the current set, setup uh, that you have now from an acceleration perspective, through if we only go through front panel, through Ethernet, we're a li somewhat limited to bumping the wire applications only or bumping the wire acceleration. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to support any coprocessor or look aside mode, have we, or has a committee thought about trying to figure out uh, a PCIe in the front panel somehow? I don't know how it could be done. But um, it does help to be, to be able to scale out some of the acceleration um, across any of these platforms, FPGA, um, accelerator through video, video cards and video, what have you. Yeah, I mean, as far as a, a sled design proposal, having a, you know, having a PCI breakout to be able to, to uh, you know, to, to chain multiple servers together, I mean, that's certainly, a, you know, certainly an option that could be exploited and that, or deployed. And there's, you know, n nothing about the, the chassis design that would prohibit that at all. Can I jump on that too? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, um, hey Alfred. <laughs> um, the OCP folks have two interest, three maybe interesting things that I do think do similar things. There were GPU cages or chassis that have PCI switches in them and then get wired to multiple adjacent servers. Um, and there's two generations of these GPU chassis. And then just, just in the last week or so, they brought up a, a large bunch of flash, uh, so it's a, a flash design with a similar architecture. So it's a whole bunch of flash in a chassis and then multiple diverse paths to alternate servers. So I think that the, the, the trick, the technique is well known by the OCP community. Right, sounds good. Thank you. And, and to that end, um, there's over uh, half a dozen suppliers that have already indicated um, their support for this uh, mechanical electrical architecture and so um, uh, we'll, we'll, we should see you know some of those companies make uh, product announcements or intents to to follow that uh, and and um, and you know we've seen interest not just from a variety of sleds but also from a variety of of um, you know uh, uh, CPU architectures that could be available in this form factor um, we certainly, you know, the, uh, support from our own Open Edge. I'm sorry, Open RMC group to support it with firmware, um, and uh, and I, we also expect to see some um, FPGA-based accelerators available as, as option options, optional sleds into this as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. 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 <laughs> you might want to repeat the question. Yeah, the question oh. was, is there, is, is there uh, any plans to have non-Intel-based uh, uh, CPU sleds? And, and like I said, there's, there's over a half a dozen companies that have already announced an intent to, at least indicated their intent and in interest in, in doing that, and, and several of those are, are uh, you know, or, or, or alternate architectures. Any other questions? All right, thank All you. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah, the, the slides will be available for all these presentations afterwards. We'll send out uh, email with pointers um, to the slides. And I think the audio recordings will be as well. If you're, uh, I saw a couple people taking pictures of the mic slides. Um, if you're interested in the chassis or more details about the chassis or the boards, 
Um, you can actually download all the CAD files for the, uh, uh, for, the, for the enclosure, and I use FreeCAD, so I've actually downloaded all the files and loaded it up through FreeCAD, and, and uh, it works fine. All that's available on the uh, OCP website. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mike. And I guess uh, everybody already sees that our, our next uh, speaker is Christian Machioko. He is with Intel. I've known him for a long time and is a principal engineer and director of the telecom systems research at Intel Labs. He works on platform and communications research in SDN and in NFV. Um, he is Intel's alternate board member to the ONF, the Open Networking Foundation, and is their principal investigator in um, sort of my cohort in an Intel AT&T co-funded research center at UC Berkeley. Um, and they also have uh, additional um, in principal investigators at Stanford, CMU, Princeton, and EPFL. Um, as well as a newly created research center at Berkeley co-funded with the VMware on edge computing. Uh, previous work that Christian has done includes wireless communications, system energy efficiency, media streaming, and IP telephony, DTV, data broadcast, optical networking, as well as representing Intel in standards organizations like the ITF, ATM Forum. Anybody remember ATM Forum? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you would. Um, and ATSC. And so he has 54 patents. Wow. Uh, ongoing patent applications co-authored 30 publications, including three best paper awards, and received two Intel Achievement Awards, Intel's highest award. Um, he earned a Diplôme d'Ingénieur, oh, I can't say it really well, um, fr from École Spéciale de Mécanique et Electricité in Paris. I probably totally ma mangled that. But please put your hands together and welcome Christian. I should stop trying French, right? <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Tom, for the introduction. And we have known each other for you know quite some time. Um, so this would be you know a software project and software running uh, on any open platform. And you know, the previous platform could be you know, a, a perfect example. Of course, we have optimized the software to run on you know, Intel architecture, but I know people have downloaded the software and run it on ARM and, and other platforms as well. Okay. So we'll talk about uh, what we call OMEC, the Open Mobile Evolve Core. It's you know, a wireless core uh, which is open source at the Open Networking Foundation and should go to uh, field trial uh, fairly soon by you know, a couple of operators, which we'll describe uh, in the slides. I'll give you a little bit of uh, ONF background, but you know, if you have a detailed ONF question, you can ask uh, definitely Tom or August here, who is the chief architect of the uh, mobile project uh, in ONF. I'll give you some uh, background, you know, some history about OMEC. Uh, why we started OMEC, uh, the features, uh, deployment, and the various options to deploy OMEC, you know, as VM or containers or bare metal. Uh, so, you know, some of it might be high level, some of it might be fairly detailed. I didn't know too much about the audience, so, you know, it's, it's a bit of a mix of, you know, uh, detailed technical uh, aspect as well as, you know, high level uh, concept. I you know what is OMEC in ONF? Uh, so ONF first, you know, most of you are probably familiar with uh, ONF, the Open Networking Foundation. It's a consortium led by a uh, major uh, operator service provider. It's being chaired by uh, AT&T. Uh, you can see, you know, uh, Dutch Telecom, uh, China Unicom, Timo um, NTT, Comcast. So, you know, a set of uh, very large uh, communication service provider. It also has... Uh, an associated board, which is called the Supplier Advisory Board, and we'll see you know, uh, its benefit in a couple of slides. Right? One of the unique uh, features of ONF, I think, what maybe can stand ONF apart, is that they have a dedicated engineering resources on board. They have an engineering workforce of between 35 to 40 people, and maybe August after can specify. 
people dedicated to a ONF project uh, as selected by the uh, operator board, right? So there is a, you know, a small number of projects. There are these dedicated people working on this project, and this is how ONF uh, can make you know, fast progress. I know uh, we'll see some of these. So I think today it's about yeah, 160 member and growing, right? So what are the current ONF project? On the left side, you see a set of reference design. And when the ONF has defined a project as a reference design, it means it will be supported by vendors. It means operators have committed to at least field try and maybe potential deployment. So there are a set of four uh, reference design today. The first one, CBA, used to be called Residential Cord, SDN enabled uh, broadband access. It's you know optical line termination switching. Uh, Trellis, it's a switching fabric uh, managed by ONOS, the open network operating system. Disaggregated transport network and UPAN. You can view UPAN as a, maybe open flow version two, uh, led by Google. Uh, try to address the shortcoming of uh, open flow and provide you know, a data center uh, management, uh, offloading, uh, you know, controlling uh, offload to the switch uh, using a P4 language. And this year, you know, two new uh, project and reference design. One is called COMAC, uh, the Converged uh, Multi Access and Core, uh, which uh, August will define uh, later this afternoon. And the other one is OMEC. The one I will be talking about uh, now. Uh, COMAC phase one will be OMEC. So again, when the ONF uh, launch a project as a reference design, it means an operator uh, stepped up and you know, uh, commit to field trial and potential deployment. In the case of OMEC, uh, T-Mobile, uh, Dutch Telecom T-Mobile Europe, as well as Sprint, uh, committed to field trial. Right? What is the ONF process, you know, and their go-to-market uh, model? So you have a set of open source component. Uh, the operator gets together. Uh, they define this reference design. At this point, you start to get, you know, a lot of interest from uh, system integrators and, you know, ODM, uh, uh, there is maybe a potential RFP down the line, as there will be you no know, uh, field trial and maybe commercial deployment, right? So, you know, it's looping around open source reference design. As they are done with reference design, they'll define an exemplar platform. The reference design, if you want, is an abstract representation. The exemplar platform is an instantiation of the reference design. So, you might have a CBA reference design but the AT&T reference platform will be different, the exemplar will be different than the Dutch Telecom exemplar platform, right? So each operator, each service provider will define its own exemplar platform. So, you know, it goes through the process and then they take the platforms through uh, field trial and maybe uh, commercial deployment. Just to show you where the current project in OMF uh, stand on this uh, process. You see on the right side uh, trellis, the switching fabric. Uh, it has been used by Comcast in a couple of regional regions uh, since Q2 of uh, 18, so over a year ago. Uh, we know CBA will be undergoing uh, trial maybe this year with AT&T or definitely with Dutch Telecom. Uh, OMEC also will be undergoing trial uh, this year with uh, T-Mobile uh, and Sprint, and we'll define later uh, some specific of the trial. And uh, Nokomak uh, just started. Uh, it's being co-chaired by AT&T and Dutch Telecom, participation with you know, all the other uh, people, and the process just started. Okay, let's uh, dive a little bit into uh, OMEC. Uh, you know, it's history, uh, feature, you know, what it is. So we started uh, OMEC a few years ago, working very closely with a few operators, Sprint, uh, AT&T, and others, trying to uh, analyze, you know, uh, 
uh, wireless traffic, real wireless traffic. Uh, we had, we were able to probe about, you know, between eight to 10,000 towers uh, inside the US to see the control and data plane traffic, you know, uh, the impact it had on a uh, EPC box, which was, you know, a traditional box. You buy an EPC from uh, traditional vendors at, you know, Cisco, Nokia, Ericsson. And we really tried to analyze the traffic uh, in all this region. And you could see that most of the time, if not, you know, always, the box was way over provisioned, right? And as you look forward to different type of new type of traffic, uh, IoT traffic uh, down the road maybe, suddenly you might end up with a box which is totally over provisioned on the data plane and under provisioned on the control plane. Let's see you have a bunch of IoT devices, static devices, sensors. They'll do a lot of, you know, uh, control traffic to go to sleep, wake up, but they send little data, right? So you have to scale the box. Well, you have to buy another box. Most often operators buy boxes in pair for redundancy. So, you know, it's space, cost, heat, uh, a lot of potential, you know, uh, uh, I would say issues. Or so we identified you know, system bottlenecks. There was some uh, publication. Again, one of the key issues was there was no independent scaling of control of data plane, right? If my workload require myself to scale the data plane, well, I have to scale the full box, right? So, you know, it was NFV, SDN, uh, early days, a few years ago, or say, or, you know, midlife. Say, hey, let's go toward a disaggregated EPC where we separate control from data plane, and 3GPP uh, was defining CUPS, control and user plane separation. Right? Let's try to build a very efficient uh, data plane uh, following, you know, a switch match action semantic, right? I set some rules uh, into a table, uh, packet is coming in, it matches, I take specific action. Let's try to make this data plane as efficient and as scalable as possible. Right? Let's show that we can scale independently control and data. And this EPC, you know, had to follow uh, operator's requirements. As you know, the 3GPP spec is, you know, very big, a lot of pages, uh, but very few of these pages are used uh, by operators for some usage model. So here we did sit down with, you know, uh, Dutch Telecom, T-Mobile, Sprint, and they have specific usage model. T-Mobile is looking for a fixed wireless access, no mobility. Uh, Sprint was looking for an IoT edge core, initially static IoT devices. So, you know, this reduces uh, the requirement on the software uh, that at least uh, initially. Right? So, again, we moved from a very... Um, compact box to the left side to a totally disaggregated model uh, on the right side, right? These are, you know, separate components. Right? Can you click? No? So what is OMEC today? You can see here a set of uh, components. We have a SNP gateway, service and packet gateway, which are disaggregated. You have a data plane and a control plane. They can operate as SNP separately, interconnected by a, what we call S5, S8 interfaces, or they can operate as an SAE gateway combining SNP. When you combine SNP as an SAE gateway, you're very, you know, one step closer to a 5G UPF, so user plane function, right? These guys today are talking to the control plane. Today it's a proprietary interface. We have, you know, partner in uh, uh, ONF currently developing what we call SXA, SXB of a PFCP. These are the three GPP interfaces to be, you know, fully standard. There is an MME, Mobility Management Engine. And today's MME, you know, is fairly lightweight, right? It needs to have added functionality. And there are, you know, an HSS, HSS database, uh, charging and billing function. I will come back later to this box, uh, SGX, uh, Secure Enclave. Secure Enclave are a feature of the Intel processor. Basically, it's an area of memory which is very secure. 
uh, nobody can break in, right? I will see the usage of uh, SGX for uh, operators. Right? So today, uh, you know, these are the features uh, provided or supported uh, by this uh, software component. Basically, we support, you know, connectivity, uh, default bearer, uh, charging, billing. Uh, it's basically, you know, uh, 3GPP release 13. Some of the components have released 14 functionality, but overall, you know, you can uh, think about this as release uh, 13 uh, support. We did spend, you know, uh, at Intel a lot of time on the data plane. Uh, we do have a library called DPDK, uh, Data Plane Development Kit. Basically, it allows you to bypass, to bypass the host kernel stack to get the packet directly uh, into uh, uh, user mode. It's very, very uh, high performance. Today, you know, you see a lot of work in the community uh, to have, you know, this feature as part of, uh, I would say, standard Linux with an AFXDP uh, type of uh, path, you know, uh, to bypass the, the kernel. Along with uh, DPDK, uh, we did a lot of work uh, to improve hashing. Here, you know, our intent was to support a you know, large number of uh, user devices, large number of flows. Uh, so you have, you know, millions of uh, entries into a table. Uh, how do you look up this table very efficiently, uh, both, you know, in terms of memory and, you know, so you don't spend time going, you know, up and down the tables. So we did a lot of work with what we call a cuckoo hash with uh, CMU, Carnegie Mellon, Dave Anderson. And we can show uh, in backup, you'll see a uh, very, very efficient way and very efficient uh, performance to look up very, very large table with millions of entries with very small degradation in, uh, in throughput. Right. Uh, so, you know, we try to use as much as possible uh, DPDKs. Uh, some of it has been uh, optimized uh, with, you know, uh, vector processing, 512-bit uh, vector processing in some of the DPDK libraries. So these are some of the optimization we did uh, for Intel-specific platforms. Let's take a look at the data plane, since we talk about data plane. Uh, we support a couple of models. Uh, the top one, which we call uh, run to completion, and the bottom one, which we call you know, pipeline. For the run to completion model, uh, packets are coming to the NIC. We use uh, RSS on the NIC, receiver-side scaling, Basically, the NIC uh, will hash the input uh, IP addresses and distribute this IP, this packet, into a specific uh, queue. Uh, here, we have a core uh, getting the data and process the data all the way through uh, to the transmit queue. So you rely on the NIC uh, to load balance traffic. Right? Uh, you want traffic coming here is a encapsulated traffic. It's a GTPU packet. So you want to load balance in the inner IP address of the packet because the outer address is the E node B address. You could balance on the E node B, but you have, you know, a much smaller entropy, much smaller number of uh, towers, and you have number of uh, user devices, right? So to get a nice entropy, you load balance on the inner address. Uh, today's uh, NIC device allows you to program the parser on the NIC, and you tell the NIC where you want to... Uh, look for a uh, packet to, uh, to hash, basically, which field you want to hash. Uh, the advantage of the run to completion, that one core uh, will process all the data. The data stays in the CPU L1 or L2 cache, right? So there is no cache trashing uh, between cores, right? And uh, you'll see the impact on the next slide. Now, maybe you want to scale to very large number of flows and you outgrow the memory of the single core and the LLC, and you want to go to a pipeline model. Here you receive a packet, you dedicate a core to a packet, you go into a queue, other packet get it from the queue, load balance to worker cores. You scale maybe better here, but you can have a lot of you know, uh, cash, uh, cash trashing, uh, cash exchange. You know, both uh, models are supported depending upon your application or your usage model. Right. What are some of the performance uh, differences? Sorry, the slide a little bit, uh, the colors a little bit uh, light. Uh, on the left side here, the 
left bar, this is a run to completion module. And the right one is a pipeline module. You can see that at small packet size, which is not a difficult packet to handle, right? the 64 byte, 128 byte, uh, significant you know, uh, performance uh, boost from uh, run to completion. Right? As you reach a certain packet size, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, packets are large enough, the incoming packet rate uh, is long enough that you know, you're, not, you're not gonna see any difference. But small packet size, uh, you can see a significant difference. You can see also that uh, you can scale uh, adding cores, right? Here we have two cores, one core up, one core down, right? As you double the number of cores or triple the number of cores, you have you know, almost a linear uh, increase in performance, right? Times two, times 2.7, right? So no, it's very flexible. Again, here we show just with like uh, 750K subscriber uh, in the lookup table. So you know, it's not a lot. Uh, you can go much higher. Okay, so what is uh, SGX? It stands for you know, Intel uh, Software Guard Extension. Again, it's an array of memory, uh, which we call an enclave. Uh, it seems to be very secure, very protected. You know, I mean, you know as secure as it can be. There's always someone who's gonna find maybe some uh, ways to get in, or, you know. We have learned last year there was, you know, always some issues. But you know, it's a very, very uh, a safe area of memory. Uh, today, of course, you know, it's limited in, uh, in memory size, but it's growing uh, with each uh, CPU generation, right? And you use the same uh, development tools. Uh, to develop with SGX, or to put something in an SGX enclave, right? It's the same uh, ecosystem, the same uh, software that you use uh, to use today. There is no, nothing different, right? But, you know, it reduce, really, really reduces the attack surface uh, for something you want to protect, right? And in the case of uh, Omec here, uh, what they want to protect is the charge record and the billing record, this information, right? We have learned, we didn't know at the beginning, and we learned from you know, operators' friends, when they want to introduce a new charging service, they need to go through the Security and Exchange Commission, uh, Sarbanes-Oxley rules, and they go through a very, very tedious uh, auditing process uh, to prove that the record have not been tampered with, that everything matches with you know, bit received and amount of money charged, right? And it takes a very, very long time, it's very painful. I've never been through it, but. <laughs> now, they think that, you know, with Secure Enclave, if they can show to the auditors that the enclave has not been tampered with, that the data extracted from the enclave, you know, is the correct data, they could significantly reduce uh, the amount of time it takes them to go through the auditing process by, you know, a factor of three or four, right? So this is where we see a lot of interest from operators in the US as well as in Europe. It's probably similar uh, rules uh, in Asia. So today, you know, we'll show a little bit of detail here. Um, uh, the various components which you have in this enclave, basically, you know, they store keys, uh, they store components. Now, yeah, you have to extract this record and send them somewhere. Again, you use, you know, uh, TLS, so, you know, encrypted traffic to go there. But if you can prove that the record you have compiled over time are correct, that's probably, you know, they think it's enough to uh, show the auditor that what they have is, uh, is, is valid, is correct. Right? So, you know, from a, an open source uh, point of view, these are the various uh, repositories available uh, on GitHub for Omec. There are about like nine repos, I think, nine or ten repos. Uh, you see the control plane repo and SGX. Uh, Stand for C3PO, this was a sprint uh, clean CUP score for packet optimization. Again, CUPS meaning control and user plane separation. Uh, there is a repo for the SNP gateway, MME, a set of repos for you know, CI CD, uh, packet generators, uh, deployment, uh, supported you know, by various uh, system integrators. We know, you know uh, GS Lab, HCL are very involved. Uh, Infosys uh, start to get involved also uh, in the project. Right. 
So you know, all this is available at, uh, on GitHub uh, at, this, at this link. Now let's look about uh, deployment uh, of OMEC. And here you know, I'll focus uh, mainly on uh, containers. So OMEC, what you see here, right, all these components can run as uh, bare metal processes, can run as uh, VMs, individual VMs, right, you can have, you know, eight or 10 VMs, or, you know, combine everything into one VM, uh, it's very flexible. Or they can run as containers, uh, Docker containers, right? and orchestrated by uh, Kubernetes. That's what we have been doing. So maybe just a high level reminder, Kubernetes has the concept of a pod. In a pod you have uh, containers, and the pod is the smallest unit uh, that you know, the Kubernetes uh, will schedule uh, to run, right? Uh, when you start pod, uh, the IP address assigned to pod is ephemeral, so you, know, you cannot rely on the IP address you might want to use a uh, name instead of labels, and you know, uh, Kubernetes will give a, a new IP address to the pod every time, right? You have the concept of service. And for example, here a service is an EPC service uh, in, in Kubernetes, and the EPC service will be a collection of pods. We have the MME, we have the HSS, we have the you know, SP gateways. Right? And controller also uh, is a concept of, uh, for Kubernetes, uh, basically where the controller uh, in the controller, you can define the number of instances uh, you want for your uh, service, and some of these uh, instances will scale you know, up and down uh, based upon some uh, thresholds that you reach. Right? So, yeah, it's easy to deploy with a container, with dockers, uh, at least it fixes you know, all the dependencies issues, but you might want to uh, optimize uh, Kubernetes uh, to achieve, you know, the highest level uh, of performance possible. And there are some shortcomings today, and I'll try to, sh to show here, you know, what we have been doing to achieve, you know, uh, high data rate uh, and, and, you know, low latency uh, under Kubernetes. So first one, uh, multiple uh, network I.O. Kubernetes, by default, on the pod, give you uh, one uh, network interface. So it means Kubernetes will assign you one IP address to one pod, it's going to provide DNS service on this IP address, but it's going to scale this IP address. Some of the components you saw uh, have, you know, multiple networks, right, the SNP gateway. Yeah, you could use one IP address and demultiplex internally, or you might want to use, you know, multiple IP addresses uh, for your container, for your pod, right? So we'll show you, you know, how, how we do this, right? Um, you want to discover uh, IP addresses when you have multiple networks. Uh, today, you know, Kubernetes doesn't do it, so you need to go through some uh, key value store components. And there are plenty of them available, right? Mm -hmm. And how do you optimize performance, you know, at runtime, right? Uh, and we'll talk about, you know, core pinning, huge pages, uh, isolation to guarantee the highest level of performance for some of the containers, not all of them, right? The one you really want, uh, low latency and high performance. So Kubernetes has this concept of uh, CNI, uh, the Container uh, Network Interface, right? And again, when you start, they give you uh, one IP address uh, for the pod, right? And they're gonna call out uh, the CNI. On the CNI, you can add plugins to the CNI, right? So for example, here, uh, you see some you know, uh, default plugin, uh, the loopback, uh, the bridge plugin, which comes from Kubernetes. Uh, at Intel, we added a few plugins. One of them is Multus, I'll describe it. Here. The other one is uh, SRIOV. Uh, what is a SRIOV? Uh, single routed IOV. Uh, for example, if you have a VM and you have a NIC, the NIC has a physical function and a bunch of uh, virtual functions, maybe 64, 128 virtual functions. If you have a VM, for example, you assign the VM to a virtual function an SRUV virtual function. When packet comes to the NIC, it's gonna go directly from the NIC into the VM, bypassing the soft switch. So you get, you know, a higher performance. Of course, you have to tell the soft switch, you know, when you set up the, the SRUV pipe, uh, you inform the soft switch that you're gonna go through, right? The soft switch still keeps control of the uh, physical function. There is one PF, per uh, NIC device, you know, and, and a lot of, of VF, right? 
So SREOV again is to uh, bypass the intermediary layer to give you the no highest performance, low latency, okay. and Multus uh, to provide uh, multi-network support. So how does it look uh, from a logical uh, representation? Kubernetes, call CNI, and here you have the Multus plugin. So Multus has been uh, developed by Intel, but uh, I know Cisco and Huawei are also working on uh, you know, multi-network plugins, so they're all probably upstream. Uh, this Multus plugin call into a flannel, which is a default one on Kubernetes to give you a one IP address, give you the ETH zero on the, in the container. And then we use uh, the SREOV plugin for some of the interfaces. And we'll see here on the data plane, two of the interfaces will go through the SREOV plugin. The other one will go through the default uh, plugin. Right? So physically, uh, this is how it looks like. This is a default interface that uh, Kubernetes knows about. Kubernetes gives an address for this interface, manages this address. And these are a couple of other interfaces where the data will be coming uh, for the data plane. These are the S1U and SGI interface uh, having data uh, flowing through, right? The other one is, you know, the control traffic. Uh, we'll talk to this pod basically to set up the tables uh, to handle the data traffic. And so you can see here, you know, uh, maybe next slide might be easier to see. Right. So we have the container, the control plane uh, container. This guy just need one interface talking, you know, on the control plane. We have the data plane container talking to the container and other components through the control plane uh, interface. And a couple of uh, SREOV based interfaces uh, for, you know, high throughput, uh, IO intensive traffic. Uh, in and out of the container. So these are SREOV traffic. Now along of SREOV, but today it's uh, a standard on uh, all NIC, I think, I think all NIC, uh, there is a feature called uh, DDIO, Direct Data IO. So when the traffic is received by the NIC, it's being DMA directly into the CPU uh, LLC. It doesn't go through memory, right? So this gives you, uh, you know, uh, lower latency when you need to uh, fetch the data, as well as, you know, energy saving, you don't have to do a road trip uh, to memory to bring the data into the CPU cache. Right? Oops, sorry. You need, as I mentioned, to discover uh, IP addresses or manage these other IP addresses that Kubernetes doesn't know about, right? In our case, we use console, you know, it's a key value store, but you can use any key value store, right? You, you uh, put your keys in and you're gonna recover them and you, know, you assign your IP addresses, you, you save the information you need to save across cluster uh, of this, of this uh, uh, you know, pod deployment. Right? You know, core pinning and isolation. On the left side, you know, you have a container or a VM and it can be running on any cores. I mean, the OS scheduler will select where he wants to put the, the, the process to be running. That's, I guess, easy, right? But you might want to optimize, right? You might want to uh, isolate to put your workload. If the workload is, you know, latency sensitive, requires, you know, high performance, you probably want to isolate the core this workload is running on, right? You, you want first to pin the workload to specific core, and you want to isolate these cores from the OS. So the OS doesn't see these cores. It's not, the OS is not going to schedule, you know, other tasks on these cores, right? So no cache trashing, no, uh, you know, no other uh, disturbance, right? And you can see here, you know, on the left side, in the pictorial, you know, you know, apps are running on any core that the OS selects. Here I say app A, I want to dedicate two cores for this app, and nobody else will go on these cores, right? So I isolate uh, these cores from the OS scheduler, right? The CPU manager in Kubernetes, and this was beta a few months ago, I think maybe now it has progressed to the next step, uh, is available and allows you to do this uh, today, right? This was some work, you know, Intel did uh, and pushed uh, into the, uh, Kubernetes, we call this EPA, Enhanced Platform Awareness. 
And I think today it changed to HPA, Hardware Platform Awareness. Another optimization, you want to use uh, huge pages. I mean, the default page size is 4K. Uh, when the data is in the TLB, basically it's fine, right? Uh, if the address is not in the TLB, it's an exception. You need to go fetch the address, put it in the table, right? Uh, this might happen a lot of time when you do, you know, packet receive, right? Uh, you have a lot of descriptors. They go in and out of the cache. If you use huge pages, one giga page, you have, you know, much less uh, opportunities or chances to get out of the uh, TLB cache, right? Now, this is good for some operations. It might be a drawback for some others. Let's say you want to do a VM checkpointing where you save you know, content from uh, VM to VM. Well, if you use a huge pages and you have only one uh, byte which is dirty, most likely you're gonna have to carry the full uh, one gig on the other side, right? So you know, based upon your workload, uh, you have to see what's the right size and what's the right optimization uh, you want to do. Again, the huge page control uh, was in beta you know, a few months ago, it's probably uh, has been pushed. I didn't check the latest status, but you know, uh, it should be released as part of uh, Kubernetes. So here are some of the um, impact or performance, right? The top row is uh, you have a native driver, I mean, a native uh, stack. You process in user space with DPDK, and you have core pinning and, you know, huge pages, and you achieve a certain, you know, packet per second rate, right? Noise is when you have a, a neighbor, which is a noisy neighbor. Someone trying to access the cache, you know, generating disturbance for you, right? So you have a noisy neighbor trying to kick you out of the cache and, and, and see what the impact is uh, with this neighbor, right? Second line is uh, Kubernetes with all the features turned on. As you can see, it's pretty much similar as native and with noise and also uh, same level of, of uh, uh, basically throughput performance, right? This is when you use the host networking stack. And we know, you know, it's not very performant, a lot of, you know, context switching. Uh, so, you know, your throughput drop uh, a lot. The fourth row is when you don't pin the core. So yeah, if there is no noise, you get the same amount of performance. There is nobody, you know, competing with you. When you start to create noise, you really drop a lot, right? You get out of cache, back in cache, out, back, right? So you see the benefit of, of doing uh, some of the core pinning uh, stuff, right? And similarly, you know, uh, with the, when you turn the huge pages, I mean, here, not a lot of impact, but depending upon your application, you could have, you know, a lot of, lot of impact. For the noise, uh, there is a feature which I didn't mention uh, in this presentation. It's called RDT. That's, uh, I guess, the uh, product name. Uh, for resource director technologies. It allows you to monitor cache or memory usage. And it allows you to allocate cache or memory for specific uh, processes, VM of containers. So you could really isolate yourself from noisy neighbor. You say, hey, for this VM, I want you know, four way entries in, in the cache reserved for me exclusively, right? Whatever the neighbor is doing, you're gonna be totally isolated uh, from this neighbor. So if you have you know, very uh, latency sensitive application that you want to isolate for any you know, interrupt or data movement, uh, you could do this for you know, both cache and memory uh, traffic. So I'll show you now uh, OMEC, NONF at MWC and you. Thanks, uh, August, for the slide. When well, you need nice slides, you know, always go to uh, August for the slide. Uh, this was, you know, shown at MWC uh, a few months ago, uh, OMEC in this uh, multi-cloud deployment. On the left side, uh, you see what we can say is a data plane, right? You have the tower, uh, it was an uh, accelerant uh, run, an accelerant run, uh, talking to the SP gateway data plane which was in Barcelona, running you know, live traffic and recorded video traffic. This guy was connected to the control plane which was hosted by T-Mobile in uh, Poland. 
right? So all the control plane uh, was in another cloud in Poland. The cloud were interconnected through a VPN because, you know, uh, this is uh, basically a lot of SCTP-based traffic, which is not supported by, uh, you know, a lot of the, I would say, standard um, of the shelf uh, component, right? But, you know, through a VPN, uh, we talked to the control plane in, uh, in uh, Warsaw. And ONAP uh, was hosted by a uh, Turk cell in uh, Istanbul. Right? I think the round trip time between uh, data and control was about 60 milliseconds uh, in this case, right? the full loop. And this worked uh, flawlessly. Right? You could see video going. I mean, we didn't see any, any impact uh, of anything. Right? So this shows you know, multi-cloud deployment. Right? So in terms of um, operators, uh, announced trial, right? A uh, couple of operators, again, Sprint and T-Mobile, uh, Dutch Telecom, T-Mobile, uh, Poland, uh, publicly announced uh, in December that they will be doing some trial. T-Mobile will be doing a fixed wireless access trial, uh, hopefully anytime soon. And Sprint uh, will be doing an IoT uh, edge core trial, uh, also, you know, hopefully uh, anytime soon. Um, that's, their, that's their timeline, right? So we should get, you know, a lot of um, uh, return from these operators. Uh, this is real deployment with, you know, real towers um, well, in, in the field, right, with real, real traffic uh, going through, uh, through the device. Right? Uh, so, you know, OMEC is available. Again, you know, it's a small subset of the 3GPP specification, right? By the way, uh, this is not a product from Intel and will not be a product from Intel, you know, to be, to be clear, right? It's a reference implementation uh, that we put in ONF with partners. Uh, now we see, you know, system integrators uh, starting to be interested. Again, you know, GS Lab, HCL, Infosys, uh, providing, you know, uh, support, adding functionality and working with operators uh, to help in uh, deployment and operation, right? Um, you know, it's COMAC uh, phase one. And, you know, please uh, come and contribute. Again, it's driven by uh, uh, whatever uh, operators request as features and whatever people are willing to uh, contribute also uh, back into uh, OMEC, right? And that's it, but, uh, last slide. All right. <laughs> if there are any questions, be happy to take a few questions. Or Hi, um, hi, sorry. Um, I was just wondering, um, with the previous presentation, there was a question about other CPU architectures coming on, and I, I think it's worth asking here whether or not OMEC um, is envisaged or anticipated to sort of see developers coming on board and expanding it to the power architectures or ARM or the like, or is it likely to sort of be, you know, in the space of AMD and, and Intel um, advantage in, in x86-64. Um, I'm just sort of, yeah, curious about that. Well, uh, we know uh, people have been uh, downloading and running this on ARM, right? Um, we know also some people have used, you know, uh, smart NICs, uh, Broadcom-based smart NICs to uh, float some of the functionality on the smart NICs. Obviously, yourself, you know, uh, we optimize for the Intel architecture. Uh, we optimize with DPDK, we optimize uh, for some of the features of the chip uh, that we have, right? But uh, same as DPDK, DPDK runs on any uh, alternate architecture, you know, ARM, anything, with any NIC also, right? Not only uh, tied to the Intel NIC, right? So yeah, it's, you know, up to you to download and, uh, and run on uh, other architecture. But there is nothing preventing it uh, from running uh, beside, you know, optimization uh, for the specific IA uh, cache architecture and, and your search. Uh. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, just a context question. You mentioned pinning. Um, since I'm not a PHY guy, and you were very much in the PHY space with that discussion of, uh, you know, separating and isolating different processes, talk for a minute about um, your, uh, your reference to uh, how you uh, proprietary or um, standard ways, uh, how you prioritize those workflows and, and do that isolation. Is that software layer a few layers yes. up? Yes, yeah, it's pure software. It's, you know, supported by uh, 
today orchestrator, you know, OpenStack also, uh, through OpenStack you can, uh, you know, pin, uh, you know, workload to core. We call this, you know, uh, EPA, Enhanced Platform Awareness. So some of the platform feature is being exposed to orchestrators. And then, you know, you as a user, you select uh, the property uh, you want, right? And the workload will be uh, pinned to CPU cores uh, and isolated uh, from the OS scheduler. You also can do it, you know, low level, uh, command line, but you know, uh, orchestrator have the ability to do this. The attribution of how that workload gets offloaded or, or isolated, is that also part of the open core spec you mentioned? Yeah, so it's, it's up to you. Uh, you know, on all these VMs, for example, here, that uh, all these components, the one we want to isolate is the data plane. Because the control plane you know, can take you know, extra latency, and, uh, but we really want to isolate the data plane component. So these are the two. For this workload, I select, say, I want to isolate this. The rest, uh, please, OS, uh, have fun. Uh, do whatever you want with it. Hi, uh, it seems uh, currently the OMEC uh, is focused on the EPC, so do you have some uh, consideration on the IMS, especially the, the Vaulty solution? I just wonder what's the difference. The IPAS? IMS. IMS, yeah. No, IMS is a workload uh, behind the EPC, you know, on what we call GI LAN, right? Us, we have not been working with IMS. We know some other companies, uh, MetaSwitch, other companies have, you know, open source IMS uh, project, right? Uh, but we are focused here only on the, on the EPC. Currently, and uh, do you have some plan in the future to uh, not Not us, but, you know, it's, if anybody wants to come provide IMS, we'll be very, very happy to have an IMS uh, component. Okay. And uh, uh, another question is, uh, what's the capacity about the T-Mobile's trial uh, on the uh, container-based uh, the, the OMEC deployment? You, the, mentioned? you mean the capacity yeah, the in capacity. terms of number of users? And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the T-Mobile specific or the Sprint specific. We know, for example, to give you an order of idea uh, that we have run uh, one or two million UEs uh, one or two million, you know, uh, phones uh, per CPU core, right? And with this level of phone uh, of UEs, we achieve about two million packets per second per CPU core for 64-byte packet, right? So, you know, uh, and again, you can scale the cores up, right? So, uh, the performance and the capacity, you know, the scalability uh, should be there. But I don't know uh, T-Mobile specific numbers. Uh, I have a question. Um, at the beginning, um, this presentation is shown as a collaboration between Intel and the Sprint. Uh, at the end, you have seen say Sprint is going to or uh, has announced the field trial. Do you have any more information about the Sprint trial? The the yeah the work started as a collaboration with you know Sprint, AT and T, and others. Uh, we know at uh, ONF Connect. Uh, in December, uh, Sprint publicly announced, uh, you know, that they will run field trial in uh, 2019 for an IoT Edge core. Uh, I don't know the detail uh, of the Sprint timeline, you know, that uh, Sprint, uh, I guess, own decision. At the same time, at ONF Connect, uh, T-Mobile announced that they will do a fixed wireless access, you know, field trial also sometime in uh, 2019. But yeah, I don't know the, I don't know the date or the details of these guys. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much, Christian. And now I'm gonna call up to the front uh, Troy Solnier from uh, Bell Canada. And Troy leads the strategy and end-to-end -end architecture for Bell Canada's network transformation. And this involves architecture alignment across domains and leveraging emerging technology to disrupt and accelerate transformation. Virtualization of network functions, VNFs, network simplification and automation are key themes in this journey. Um, he provides leadership for COs to data centers, conversion, 
workload mobility, and the push to move from virtual machine-based to containerized functions. To support VNFs beyond the DC, universal customer premise equipment solutions are essential. SR 5G and wireless to the home provide opportunities for wireless and wireline convergence. Network service orchestration is being built with open network automation platform, ONAP. Hardware and software disaggregation, wireless and wireline convergence, and open source are levers to use uh, to instigate change. With 20 years at Bell, congratulations. <laughs> um, Troy's held a number of roles, primarily in technology, R&D, and strategy. In a previous role, he provided the strategy to extend the fiber to the home network to the majority of their locations. So if you're a Canadian, you should be happy about that. Troy holds a Master in Engineering in the Internetworking from Dalwies University and a Master in Science in Computer Science from Acadia. He's based out of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Wow. Long trip. Long, Long trip. trip so welcome to Denver. Thank you very much. And I understand that we get to um, so the format, use a different format. The format's a, a little different. Uh, maybe we'll have and see should here. We, um, you know, I don't have, do you want me to say the whole thing about you too, Heather? Sure. While you're that way it'll be done for my, my presentation. Yeah. That's right. So after. Heather's going to speak later, but since she's up here now, um, uh, she is the OPNFE director and works with the community to advance uh, the adoption and implementation of open source NFE platform. She oversees and provides guidance for all aspects of the project from technology to community and marketing and reports to the OPNFE board of directors. Sorry about that. Um, actually, actually, you've also got a slightly older bio uh, now. Oh, do I? Yeah. <laughs> so you are we, now. <laughs> uh, since we brought all the projects together under LFN, I'm doing community and ecosystem across all the projects. Community and ecosystem yes. across all the pro That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So the one-stop shop, actually. Um, <laughs> so she's led strategic technology alliances for MongoDB uh, before joining the Linux Foundation. And earlier in her career, she's held various leadership positions in the telecom industry, including running a partner program for CPE, doing solutions marketing for the IP division at Alcatel Lucent, business development and partnering in numerous standards activities. With I remember her from those. <laughs> and she received her master's degree in English literature Ooh. from U of, U of Texas, Austin. Yeah. OK, so let's welcome them again. Yeah. And, um, uh, have a seat, Tom. All right, so um, as mentioned, uh, we decided to change up the format um, a little bit and actually turn this, rather than a presentation, you, so you've got lots of presentations that are going to be coming at you today. So uh, we've decided to actually approach this as a fireside chat uh, with, bo with both uh, Troy and, um, <laughs> and, and, and Tom here. Yep. And talk about sort of their experiences as operators, um, thinking about um, you know sort of the evolution of their edge, the services that they're wanting to deploy there. Um, I also think you know since we have you know sort of change up the format a little bit, like to encourage audience um, participation and questions. So don't feel that you need to hold your questions till the end. I think the more interactive we are, um, and the more we kind of do some uh, you know information sharing together, I think that'll be more interesting and, and more fun for all of us. So anyway, so thank you to uh, Tom and Troy. We've got alliteration up here uh, for yeah. agreeing, agreeing to do this, so. It's our pleasure. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I'm glad that the change of format it meant that uh, you know, I didn't have to do slides. To do slides, yeah. So <laughs> all we're missing really for the fireside chat is some marshmallows and yeah. maybe, uh, maybe a beer, but uh, we'll forgo those. So from an edge perspective, um, you know, the, the first thing that we start to think about uh, as an operator is, is why do we need to go there? And, and it's a valid question that I'm not sure, you know, in the industry, everyone's so focused on 5G, getting out to the edge, building everywhere, and you don't always have to go as far as, far as some people suggest, right? Mm -hmm. And so there, there are four kind of variables that I, I think about uh, in our organization when we talk about edge. So there's, uh, you know, looking at uh, latency requirements. So obviously when you get into 5G, when you get into ultra low latency applications, factory floor kind of stuff, uh, VR, AR applications, you know, sub five millisecond, you need to get really close to the end customer. And so that, that's one, one variable that if you have those use cases that you're deploying, you need, to, you need to go there. Another one is optimizing your cost structure for uh, your transport network and, and, you know, with your compute at the edge. 
And it's interesting because it's very different depending on, on the operator and, and what their, what their uh, you know, makeup is. So if you're a wireless operator who doesn't own wireline assets, you're very incentivized to go as far, you know, as close <laughs> to the customer as you can to arbitrage right? you know, that, that out of the equation. And we're very fortunate in Canada where, you know, you guys are as well, we, you, we own the transport. And so that's not as much of an issue. It's still part of the equation, but it's mm -hmm. not as much of an issue. Uh, the other one uh, that's, um, that's, uh, that's really interesting is, uh, so as, you know, Tom would share this with me as well, as operators who've been around for a long time, we have a lot of assets out in the field and we wanna, we wanna leverage those and, and monetize those as much as we can. And so we may f be faced with an interesting situation where maybe the right place to put a workload is actually in your local data center, so a regional data center. Mm -hmm. Should maybe take a second I'm sure everyone's familiar, kind of global data center serving, you know, multiple states, local, regional, you know, kind of a, maybe a 20, 30 COs and then last serving CO. That's kind of the, the way that we break it down. So mm -hmm. the best place might be to serve it in your local or regional CO, but it's full. And so do I really want to spend three, five million dollars on doing all of the uh, work to, you know, change out my uh, cooling and power and so on when I could actually distribute that out to all those last serving COs at a fraction of the cost and use you know, ambient air cooling. Now that leads me to the next part of the, the discussion I think which is in order to even think about that and deploying out to all those last serving COs or even cell towers, uh, you, know, you need to be able to deploy hardware that's drop in, very low impact, uh, technicians you know, can't, uh, can't require a PhD to install this stuff. Right. And it needs to be 100% orchestrated remote. So command and control, you need to be able to drop that in, and you need to be able to uh, call home, zero touch provisioning, configure the, configure the equipment that you've deployed, configure the operating system on top of that, uh, and then the software stack on top, and the applications, mm -hmm. and lifecycle management. So right. that's a, the, a, it may be a starting point to get us into the dialogue of, of the way we start thinking about right. this. Yeah. And I would, um, I would echo a lot of what you said there, that, um, with AT&T, we started off with AT&T's integrated cloud. It was a, yeah. we, we had an acronym for everything. <laughs> <laughs> Love those TLAs. We're in the telecom yeah. world. Yeah. If there's not an acronym, acronym, it today? doesn't exist. It doesn't exist so no. AIC was um, our initial foray into computer, in, computer infrastructure. It is NFVI from the yep. old Etsy days. And deployed, well, the only way you could in more centralized locations because you cannot afford both the time or the capital yeah. to make data centers out of every central office on the planet. It just, you could never get it done. And so what we did is had fairly centralized locations. We had national data centers. We started off with compute there. And then we came up with a number of, you know, the football cities in the United States to deploy <laughs> infrastructure. Yeah. And then, um, well, this is an interesting thing because one of the things that prevents you from going farther than that is this is raised floor, you know, high, high number of kilowatts per rack, and you could, even though we're, I'd like to get there and we're not quite there yet, you could do rack scale operations where you only rack and roll entire completed systems at a time. It's in our future. We need to get there. I, I'm antsy to get, you know, I'm the guy that always tries to get this stuff to happen. Um, but at the edge, things are quite different, right? So if you go all the way to the, the extreme where Troy was mentioning in cell sites, you often have controlled environment vaults, you have huts, you have things that have, you know, steel, uh, a steel containerized um, enclosures that are not like data centers at all. And you could be lucky that they have some kind of HVAC of any sort. Um, same with central offices. They yep. don't have raised floors, they have, an extremely reliable DC power plant. It really is five nines, but it really doesn't have many kilowatts in it, right? It's, it's, not, it's not huge. Um, similarly, there's not a lot of cooling in those locations. So I have to inject in, just, just on that comment of yeah. power density, it's interesting as we started to convert our, our central offices to data centers you know, further out a little bit, we found that if we actually took an entire lineup Mm -hmm. of, of DMS bays, for those who are old enough to remember what those are. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, it's you a telephone would, network. <laughs> right, it's a telephone network. You, you would end up with a ton of space, so you could put lots of compute in there, but you actually only free up enough for a half rack of compute. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, so, I totally concur. Exactly. So, um, you know, high density is not exactly what we're looking for. In fact, 
low density does better if we don't mm -hmm. have to upgrade the cooling systems, if we can make use of existing um, infrastructure. And the good news is the compute gets better and better every year. That, that low density actually gets more and more done. And indeed, um, you know, we see a, a good march from uh, data centers into what I would call edge augmented compute topologies. Yep. So we don't think everything's going to go to the edge. You know, let's face it, the super huge, uh, you know, web scale data centers have the economies of scale that you're yep. never going to get into a central office. And so th very large workloads are likely to still be well positioned in those locations. What's really interesting for me is that um, communications as a workload isn't something that can be put just anywhere. Place matters. Your communications has to be between here and there. And so therefore, now a physical topology and not just thinking in the cloud matters to the workload itself. So that's one no-brainer, duh, you gotta, you gotta go to the edge for that. And we're all busy changing 5G access, wireline access, whatever, whatever you think you know, telcos used to or communications providers did, that's becoming virtualized and going to the edge. And then I think it's sort of a, what do you call it, a fortuitous circle. Once, yep. you, once you have the infrastructure to support communications, you've made the business case to deploy something out there, right? I, if I were to go to, and I do, right? I talk to our business guys about AR, VR, yeah. um, XR, it goes on and on. There's lots of R's. That's a nice <laughs> and, and they're all going to be extremely lucrative one day, maybe. Um, so, but in the meantime... You need the anchor use case. That's right. You need the anchor That's use right. case. That's right. I, I cannot make a, let's build it, they will come. No. Um, but I can make the case to say, I'm going to put our own, we're going to eat our own dog food. Yep. We're going to build, oops, mm -hmm. we're going to build AT&T's communications infrastructure on this and it needs to be reliable enough to support all that. And oh, by the way, once that's done, there'll be capacity where we can ramp up, yeah. right? These types of new applications, once the hype's gone over and they start actually happening, it could work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you brought yeah. up something that I, you know, I, I'm sort of curious about, kind of the state right now of kind of the, the business case argument. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been, you know, started talking about Edge a couple, you know, years ago, um, and everyone was throwing out VCPE or, you know, yeah. maybe selling space to, to enterprise people to offer their applications. Um, you know, 5G has got a lot of focus right now and then maybe some 5G-enabled services. So what right now are the use cases that you're finding um, compelling internally that you're able to, you know, start getting you know, people the wanting momentum. to do and invest, invest and get the momentum rolling? Yeah, it's a great question. And you know, Tom brought up a good one around, around communication infrastructure. Uh, another good one for any operator who's also in the TV business is caching close to the edge. And so that optimizing that equation of, of transport costs versus compute close to the customer and customer experience is a huge thing. It, I don't know if there's any Game of Thrones fans here in the audience, but when uh, <laughs> I'll put both hands up. I when, only have watched half of last night's episode that yeah, I've said. Yeah, I was pretty tired last night and I missed it. So yeah. <laughs> but so so we, we hold the rights in Canada for, for yeah. Game of Thrones. And so when we launched it, we needed to really upgrade uh, you know, all, all of our infrastructure to make sure mm -hmm. that it was a great quality, you know, customer experience was bang on, there were no, no hiccups. And so we don't have all of that deployed out to the edge yet. But had we done that, mm -hmm. the experience would have been entirely different, right? And we could have, right. we could have you know, the, the great thing about <clears throat> orchestrating all of that infrastructure in the software stack out at the edge is you can say, well, today I'm going to use that for communication infrastructure, and maybe I'm gonna, I've got some IoT apps or whatever. I know Game of Thrones is coming. I'm going to repurpose a bunch of that. I'm going to shift some mm -hmm. of those other workloads back into the core, back into my global data center, and I'm going to make sure that my customers get the best experience, and that's actually a service differentiator. So, right. so that's one of our anchors. So the battle of Winterfell is not quite as dark. As it's <laughs> not as dark, no, no. So that's, that's a really good use case, and good I think a number of, of operators are, are, are look, you know, looking at that. And we've, we're already you know, in the process of, of doing that down to at least the local. We think that's the first play. That's another good mm -hmm. thing, too, to, to, for people to really think about and understand. Edge, in my perspective, doesn't mean deploy everywhere right away out at the edge, right? Out at the last serving CO, for example. 
uh, there, there's a play to actually deploy from your global data center with a common hardware software stack at your your you know your local data center. Mm -hmm. and the value of doing that is now you're managing it all the same way, and you're starting your your operations are learning, you're you're improving your overall uh, you know business model and technology mm -hmm. model before you get to thousands and thousands and thousands right. of sites, yeah. which is right. a good thing. Yeah. And I think I, I think I saw hand raised in the audience. Yeah. So just to talk a bit more about the user cases. Yep. So if you talk about more the entertainment side, gaming side, uh, we're seeing Stadia coming in, we're seeing GeForce Now was there. Mm -hmm. So not just latency now, but then user uh, response. That becomes very, very interesting. So can you talk a bit more about that and how that could impact? Sure, the, sure, uh, absolutely. Yeah, so the, edge computing. so, so the, the Stadia example, you know, as everyone here knows, there's not enough known about it. Uh, you know exactly how how the how the technology is going to work and what latency requirements you need to achieve the user performance, you know, for for their live gaming. Given the fact that all of the actual rendering is being done off board and then being sent down to the customer, as opposed to today's current way of doing it, uh, our current view is that we think that local is going to serve the immediate need for that. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's I don't think it's a use case that's going to need you know mean that you need to go to the last serving CO. And the reason right. I say that, and, and, and Tom, who's a fiber guy, will, will probably back me up on this, is, is light goes really fast. <laughs> and, and yes, <laughs> it does. <laughs> In fact, nothing But microwaves go faster, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, as, as long, as, as, long as you, you have a, and this is the key, I think, as long as you have a clear, good transport path from your local data center to where your customers are, even though they're going through a last serving CO that may not have compute there, I think you're still going to be positioned really, really well. Is that, a, that answer up? Right. So I could... If, Feel if free you to don't mind, yeah, yeah I'd please. love to talk, don't I? Um, <laughs> so I, first of all, I want to back up and say that I think there's a lot uh, to what uh, Troy said earlier, that a lot is being done now at sort of the front end of innovation on how gaming and all the R's could mm. uh, work out. But what's clearly, what's a clear and present opportunity, in my opinion, is that the, um, it's what I'd call bandwidth intensive applications. And so if you look at the architecture of the network, it's like a big tree, right? Mm -hmm. And all of the users are the leaves of the tree. And the trunk has various sizes, but for one thing, the trunk is a bottleneck at the end of the day. If you start adding up all of the branches and then all of the twigs, and look at all the bandwidth at the far edge where you are serving customers directly, the total amount you can deliver in the network goes way, way, way up. So to me, it's, it's a simple, simple thing. CDN is the classic example of a bandwidth hungry application. You want lots of data delivered, so you're gonna bring it close to the end and then deliver on demand. It's not necessarily the only application like that, but it's, it's one where simple technologies and today's applications can make use of it. You don't have to wait for innovation to kind of develop new kinds of, of, of architectures. Um, but then there, there is a lot in this edge for the low latency. I think a lot of it still needs to be worked out. And I think a lot of it also needs to be kind of uh, one of the reasons. We spend so much time talking community, talking about open, coming to places like this and just talking, um, <laughs> yep. is that I think if only AT&T were to do this, or only Bell, uh, it's not gonna go very far. No. That as a gaming software writer, you wanna know that you're gonna have this uh, resource available nearly globally. It, you know, just pockets of it here and there is gonna make you say, it's kinda interesting, maybe if I could make a ton of money on it, I could do something, but generally I'm going to, I'm going to architect my gaming platform for the least common denominator in a large market. And so it means that carriers need to get their heads together and it needs to become kind of a, a universal capability. And maybe not universal, but it needs to be a lot more available than, than we, what we have today. Agreed. So sort of you were talking a little bit about kind of how you, 
you know, are viewing the, the, the journey, right? You know, we, you know, started NFE and we started getting our global data centers together and now we're pushing it out to, you know, local, you know, where are, where are y'all currently in, in the journey and what technology have you chosen to use so far? That's a good one. Do you it's a good one. I can go. I already mentioned AT&T's integrated cloud, right? There's, um, um, oh gosh, we've gone through is it two or three generations of AT&T's integrated cloud? So we did the first one. We realized all the things we did wrong. We did a second one. <laughs> we realized that again. We're in the third generation of that sort of centralized cloud. Um, then there is the, then we've got a new one called the, the 5G cloud, which is um, more attuned to managing uh, containers. So instead of running OpenStack and then running containers in, in VMs. We start with containers and then we'll bring up bits and pieces of OpenStack that we might need as containers in that model. And if you guys have watched what Airship is doing, you know all this yep. already. It's not, no, no rocket science or secrets here. And then now we are working on, and in fact there's so much yapping today about this open edge is how do you deploy things in those COs, the ones that you can't afford to turn into data centers? You know, AT&T's got over 5,000 COs. I can't go and turn them all into data centers overnight. But I need to go there. If I want to serve PON, if I want to serve 5G, um, there are phi limits. I can't, you know, PON has a 20 click diameter, right? And so the equipment that serves those users has to be within 20 kilometers of the people that are gonna be served. That means that equipment needs to go there and gotta find a way to have small, scale down equipment that gets operated and managed the same way so that I have operational efficiency, but that I can kind of cookie cutter into those locations. So I'd, I'd echo a lot of that, that uh, similar approach. One of the things that we did when we said as we're going from our global data centers, which same thing, primarily was all OpenStack based, uh, you know, we said we're going to be Kubernetes based as mm -hmm. we get into to local and, and last serving COs. And same thing, you know, whether, whether it's Rancher VM or, um, uh, or Libvirt, we, we actually run VMs on a base of Kubernetes as opposed to having any open stack whatsoever in that environment. But beyond that, we actually are, are looking at some of the future you know, kind of capability that we're gonna need to have. And one of the use cases that we haven't talked about yet is, is IoT and video. Mm -hmm. So video analytics is a great edge use case. Uh, and uh, you know, having that ML capability with Kubeflow as part of your software stack is one of mm -hmm. the things that we're, we're actually uh, looking at go forward. So, you know, if you look at the, there's hardware uh, components that we need to have as part of the stack, we know that we're not going to be in a position to say it's all going to run on x86. We had this right. great discussion earlier, uh, you know, about having to offload that uh, with hardware acceleration. So whether it's an N3000, uh, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's an ARM, whether it's, uh, you know, something else, we want to be able to do that. Uh, we run Kubernetes on, typically we're, we're, we're looking at immutable OSs, so core OS as a base, so that mm -hmm. we're not having to deal with patching. It's part of the make it easy to manage uh, right. kind of a strategy. And then on top of that, we would have uh, our CNIs, Multis, of course, so that we can have mul you know, multiple things there. Another big play that we're doing is, is looking at uh, BPP as a technology for acceleration. Mm -hmm. So Contiv is, is a big part of our strategy go forward, in fact, we're, we're collaborating quite heavily with, with Pantheon to actually contribute that up sort, you know, upstream in the community. Cool. And, uh, and, and we're actually looking at, uh, I'm a bit all over the place here, but we're, no, we're, 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 we're looking at that uh, in terms of um, alternatives to GPUs, to, to, to a GTP. Mm -hmm. So we talked about you know, the 5G cloud kind of yeah. progressing. So if you think about uh, now I've got an SRV6 kind of data plane that I can, that mm -hmm. I can manage uh, my wireline and wireless workloads on, all of a sudden I've got something really interesting right. because I can manage that through the whole network. I can start at both origin points to actually de determine what that path should look like, what kind of service chaining I want to happen through the network. So it can become really mm -hmm. interesting. If you start to put the right pieces in your software stack and make it common and take the pieces that you need at the right points in the network. Makes sense. Yeah. So other thing we should probably bring up around the where do you deploy and where do you find edges mm -hmm. is um, <laughs> universal CPE. Yes. We talked about yes. it together. Yes. And, That's um, a good point. And you reminded me, Heather, when you said um, virtual CPE, that one of the things that is another 
interesting location is I believe that for enterprise, you know, you used to have managed enterprise services, yep. and they came with a boatload of equipment all strung together like beads on a string. <laughs> you'd have your firewall, you'd have your intrusion detection Just, system, you'd yeah. have your WAN accelerator, you'd yep. have your SD-WAN box, you'd have, oh, I probably said firewall already, and then you might have other things like a, you know, DDoS or whatever. All kinds of yep. stuff. And it looks really good to have a sort of a single, I would call it a data center in a box. It's yep. got a switch, switching silicon and a CPU. And the switching silicon handles all of the packet shuffling, right? Like you're okay. going to deal with a deck. And then the CPU can handle workloads that used to be separate appliances. Yep. And it's, it, the carriers love it, the, the enterprise customers love it, and it can be orchestrated and set up with container-based exactly. VNFs, very similar to things that we would put at the edge of our own network. So it's really nice in that regard. And, and there's two, I think, you know, huge advantages to taking a similar strategy at, with UCPE as we would with an edge, you know, kind of uh, architecture. In fact, we view UCPE, uh, last serving CO edge, local DC, you know, global mm -hmm. data center and public cloud as a continuum of right. place we run work. It has like to that's, be. That's, that's, that's the way we're trying to, I mean, there's still obviously some growing to, to do there. But from a universal CPE perspective, if you ensure that that's running Kubernetes, now you can participate as part of that continuum. It also means that you're removing the tax for the extra OS and, and for the right. hypervisor. So instead of being able to run, say, two or three maybe, because you've got yeah, to right. put a whole <laughs> bunch of cores to make these, these workloads work at the universal CPE, I might be able to run six or eight. So all mm -hmm. of a sudden, for the same cost, from an Air Force perspective, you can run a whole lot more workloads. You can collapse more boxes down into one. Right. Exactly. So that's, that makes it interesting. And, and it, it means that another use case where there are customers out there, enterprise customers, who want to arbitrage their connectivity costs. I don't know why they'd ever want to do that. Why would they want to do that? Anyway, we, we realize that's the case, and so we need to participate as part of that, uh, part of that journey, part of that ecosystem. And so if we're, we're providing a place for enterprises to run their workloads as part of an edge strategy, then it means that at least we're going we're gonna to retain a bunch of that revenue, right? So that's good. Yeah. So one, one other question. Uh, someone out in the audience? Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Kevin McBride from CenturyLink. Yeah. So if we rewind your conversation back to your central central office transformation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going into classified switching, we're using ironwork, we're using floor space, have you guys encountered any issues with introducing non-NEBS equipment into those facilities and what kind of challenges yeah. have you faced and what are your yeah. strategies to overcome placing this type of hardware in, in those uh, type of locations where NEBS certification or your own internal certification may right. um, have that? Right. So we have our own internal certification. It's yep. a lot like NEBS. In fact, it's really a lot like NEBS. Um, and it's really difficult to get things in a central office that don't meet those requirements. Um, one of the things, well, there's a, couple of, there's a couple of different things you can do. And we've actually written a white paper around CO to data center transformations with TIA. So I want to sh shout out there that they talk and describe a lot of different options that you might do. So you might do carve outs where you do upgrades. You might do enclosures where everything outside the enclosure is NEBS and inside it's its own little, um, you know, isolated domain. But um, as I said just a few minutes ago, right now um, we're very bullish on this open edge that it is NEBS, it is DC powered, it's short depth, all of, all of the operations are from the front, and it's modest size compute, right? So we think that there's, um, that there's an easy way to put that in central offices without having to do a lot of carve outs or special enclosures or new power supplies or what have you. That's kind of the direction for that very, the serving office, if you will. Once you get farther in, once you get to the point where you're deploying rows of yeah. servers, then it, the, the, the calculus changes, right? Because shallow means you're probably in one socket systems instead of two. Yeah. And you really want to be able to, to make good use of real data center infrastructure in those locations. So in the, there is a crossover point where you say, okay, I'm going to bite the bullet. We're going to do a real, <laughs> you know, we're going to kind of move from the telco regime into the data center regime. And not just regulations, but the rules, the culture. So many things are different between CEO and data center. And I don't know if it will be true forever, but it's, it's certainly going to be true for a, a while longer. Is that fair? Yeah. 
No, that's that's very fair. In fact, the the whole carve out thing, we've we've looked at that as well. Unfortunately, it goes against the the strategy of trying to minimize your office infrastructure right. and cooling power right. spend. Right. You want to spend your money on compute, which is going to run the workload. Right. So uh, it's a last resort for us, mm -hmm. and we're we're on the same boat of front loaded, short. Uh, you know, one plug for power, one plug for for network. Right. Easy to install. Right. Okay, question at the front. Donnie Jackson, Urgent Communications. Hey. Um, I know you all have been talking about different use cases on the commercial side. Uh, I know AT&T has won the, the first net contract in the United mm -hmm. States, and who knows what's going to happen in Canada soon. Um, I was just curious, what um, does, I guess, when as you look at public the public safety use case, mm -hmm. where does some of this edge technology where do you see that fitting in, and is it help allay some of the fears of some of these guys that, frankly, have been able to go walk down the hall and hug their their server, even if they don't know what it means, um, mm -hmm. with, with their LMR systems? Right. So um, we started deploying FirstNet on legacy architecture. The time to market was the important thing in that, and so um, using disaggregated and and virtualized architectures for communications is what I would call an emerging tech, emerging technologies. I'd like to see it done first in an area where there's less risk. We, I'm, hello, I'm a telco. We're risk averse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, we'll start with things like IoT platforms and emerging systems um, and then roll them into you know more mainstream things and my guess, and I don't, this is not an inf not informed, I have no idea, but my personal guess is that uh, public safety would be among the last things uh, that would move into this kind of environment. Unless there's a kind of a killer app, there's something you could do in the new environment. Um, and there are really interesting, uh, I don't know, we could go into that because yeah. we were, you started by saying use case. And one of the things we're doing um, where I work in Atlanta is looking at um, volumetric video and if you think about 5G and the bandwidth you get from it, you wind up understanding that in a not too distant future, five or six people could hold up the cameras with their cell phones and collect enough views from around a situation to complete a 3D model that could be analyzed and used and, and kind of, whether it's a sports or a entertainment or whether it's a first responder situation, it could be sort of a killer app that got you someplace you couldn't have gotten with legacy equipment. So. Um, wow. The, so the question was, did we learn anything from FirstNet that translated back to the um, legacy to the regular network? I don't know. You know. Question over there. Yeah. So uh, one of the latency sensitive applications that will require edge computing is V2X communications. Yep. And I'm just wondering if you've thought about that has an another element of mobility. Have you thought about inter edge mobility and what challenges do you see? Have you thought about MEC sharing, um, sharing the infrastructure mm -hmm. with the other telcos? And mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? That's a, that's a good question. For, first off, I'd say from a VDX perspective, I, I think we believe that a lot of the communication is actually, like all the telemetry information, uh, the, the existing network and the, and the new evolving network is going to be able to handle that. It's adding telemetry back into the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication to ensure that the best decisions are being made for mm -hmm. safety. Um, so, uh, so connected car and stuff, I, I don't think that applies. It's more the, the, the direct VDX use case. Um, to your question about is it a use case on a roadmap, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're closely following the standards and working with other operators to do that, other global operators to do that. To your second part of the question, which was, you know, are we considering sharing mech infrastructure to, to, to make that better? I think we're trying to wrap our heads around that. I mean, we, we certainly made that decision in Canada through mm -hmm. Mockin. For, uh, for a 4G network, and we share that with, with TELUS, the other operator there, uh, which helped us from a capital perspective. So we, we may come to the same conclusion. I don't know yet. So I think the jury's still out on, on that, but it's an interesting uh, you know, problem that we'll need to solve. Thank you. 
All right, well, we are getting uh, close to time here, so I, I'll end this by asking the two of you one sort of final question on my side, which is, um, you know, sort of understanding, you know, working on the assumption, which I think when I asked you about the technology you're using sounds relatively true, that you're, you know, you're going to be doing this with open source components. Mm -hmm. What do you think are the kind of highest priority um, sort of things that you, you know, would, that you need from what's going on in the open source um, communities, you know? Right, right now, for, mm -hmm. for, for, the, for the technology that we're yeah. all producing to really enable you know, the, this continued um, transformation. So I, I think uh, on, on the Kubernetes orchestration side, it's, it's pretty robust. Like, uh, you know, we, we, we typically don't have an issue there. It's more the stuff, all the ancillary stuff around that. So we're, as you heard earlier, we're, you know, we're investing in, in, in upstreaming a bunch of stuff around networking. So I think that is a key, uh, that's a key area, specifically next generation networking where we can, we can leverage things like vector packet processing to really reduce our reliance on things like SROV, which mm -hmm. is really challenging to, to manage uh, and, and ties up resources. Uh, and the other area would be storage. So there's a lot of different options for Kubernetes and storage. And uh, <laughs> none of them are, none of them, answer all the questions right. and check all the boxes. So I think, you know, whether you're going to use Rook or whether you're going to use, you know, GlusterFS or, uh, you know, whether you're going to use MapR, I think, uh, I think putting some concerted effort around storage uh, for, for Kubernetes when you think about things like video analytics, clearly that's going to be a big use case for it. So that would for be sure. my two things. Okay. Okay, so first of all, I agree with the ones you said. So I'm going to just sort of. Yeah, I was hoping I was going to be able to get a little bit of disagreement and debate between these two. Okay, but, right. um, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, I guess it is good that you know, there's great. some consensus. Yeah, well, less good. filling. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I'll take it in a different direction yeah. just for fun. And maybe yeah. you will disagree with me or maybe not. But um, for open source communities, I said something earlier. Just remember that uh, I believe the whole infrastructure of third-party edge compute platforms is something that needs to be done across carriers and needs to be done as a community and not just as a standalone thing. And I'd actually take that a little bit further. We're now at the cusp of 5G, and I know you've all heard way more about 5G. Well, you're all here, aren't you? You're gonna hear way more about 5G the rest of this week than you probably ever wanted to. Um, and it's not just one thing. There's, there's lots of different aspects and facets of 5G, and everybody wants it now. So uh, my argument, and, and um, it's one that AT is, is, I would call it the AT&T argument, it's not just mine, but my management as well, is that 5G has very nearly been specified by 3GPP and others, and now it's time to build it. And okay, we could do what we've done in the past where Nokia will build it in their vertically integrated box and Ericsson will build it in their vertically integrated box and so will Samsung mm -hmm. and Cisco and the ho whoever else. But guess what? About 90% of the 5G is specified and non-differentiating. Everybody has to build the same thing. And why do that? A community is the way to have, and it does really well with the problem at hand, which is we all need to have something new that we ha need to work on together. It's not going to be differentiating at the end of the day, and to have a common pool that we all draw from is probably the fastest time to market that we could get that done with. And so I'm very big proponent that best is time to market best cost best user experience that's right and so I hate to say and it, by the way interop <laughs> is not a problem because it's all based on the same code right, <laughs> right? so th that I believe is is sort of the, the big deal with with open yeah so I, I think um, every operator is 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 gonna probably you know put their recipe together slightly differently. But if we're all using the mm -hmm. same recipe book at least, and we're all picking from the same ingredients, that's right. then that's a winning solution, right? Because th there might be differentiation, and the differentiation I think is gonna happen at the use case layer, at the services layer, but there might be something that you want, something different that right. you wanna do down at the infra layer that's gonna make your service stand out. That's right, you can make beignets and I can make funnel cakes. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so you know, I, I think the important thing is not that everybody ha everybody buys you know, an airframe, or everybody buys, you know, uh, an HP box, or everybody, I think the important thing is that everybody has a common set of ingredients with right. open interfaces and, and a way to, to connect them together. And, 
you know, you may go, you may you think of it like, you know, going to, to the restaurant. You may pick three or four things. You may pick right. three common things, but something that's different for your use case. Mm -hmm. And I think that's okay. And frankly, I think once you get past tier one operators, the desire for cookie cutter, turnkey, you know, I, I'd like to just use the thing everybody's using becomes, goes way up. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a big opportunity for open source and system integrators that build on it. Yeah, well, I was going to say, you, you brought up interop and, and compliance testing, which mm -hmm. is where I am <laughs> living uh, most of my days right now. And so, um, I, yeah, and I, you know, the thing that we keep getting pulled over and over again is to you know, kind of come with the mindset of, you know, more and more cookie cutter, mm -hmm. better interop, um, you know, apply some of that, you know, traditional telecom experience of um, the importance of compliance testing and bad badging programs, but through open source right. and things like that, which has been a really, you know, it's a large part of the rest of my job, but it's been an interesting journey to kind of think about what that means too, and I think it will continue to be important um, okay. for this as well. That's great. That's good. Excellent. All, All right. right. Uh, well, we sorry. are five past, so apologies, but I think it was sorry. a great oh. Just one more question. People willing to stay a couple minutes for one last question? Sorry. Sure. Uh, so can you please talk more about uh, what do you think, uh, where the GTP can be terminated and uh, uh, where the IP can be exposed and uh, the benefit it brings to the enterprise customers? I am happy to talk about that, but it is probably not a 30 second discussion. Right. <laughs> so what I would recommend is send, have... send me a note and I'm happy to connect you with actually some thought leaders in that field like uh, Naturo, uh, um, Dan from our, our shop. I'm happy to connect you with the right folks. Okay. Thanks, thanks very much, cool. everyone. All right. So and thank you very much, uh, Tom and Troy. So. Thank you. Thank you.